My name is Lydia Ortega. I'm one of the faculty members here at San Jose State University and one of the team members who puts together this provocative lecture series. Tonight, we're very happy to have a guest speaker from the Cato Institute. Before I introduce our speaker, let me do some housekeeping rules and make sure that you know that your phone should be off, that the bathrooms are over there, and that after every provocative lecture, we invite our guests, the students, and anybody who's here to join us at the Flames Restaurant, where you can have tiny, tiny slices of pizza and small cups of beer, but continue the discussion with the faculty and with our speaker, and get, just keep thinking about the ideas presented to you today. So let me introduce our speaker. Clark Neely is a Vice President for Criminal Justice at the Cato Institute. His areas include constitutional law, overcriminalization, civil forfeiture, police accountability, and gun rights. Neely is the author of Terms of Engagement, How Our Courts Should Enforce the Constitution's Promise of Limited Government. His writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and National Review, as well as many different law reviews. Uh, he is a frequent guest speaker and lecturer at the Federalist Society, the Institute for Humane Studies, and American Constitution Society. Before joining Cato in 2017, Neely was a senior attorney and constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice and director of the Institute's Center for Judicial Engagement. Currently, Neely is active in starting a public interest law certificate program. And I thought about that. I said, well, why do you want to have that program? Because I want to make legal students, law students, more employable in the area of public interest law. And I, you realize, I asked him, that they will be competing with you for jobs. And he goes, yep, not a problem. So I'm really pleased that he's sharing his expertise. So tonight, we're going to explore the question, has American criminal justice system fallen apart? Is it even legitimate? Are we an incarceration nation? I invite you to listen, to relax, to consider the possibilities, and just to think. Mr. Clark Neely. Does anybody recognize these? If you do, they're up here. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, I want to begin by thanking Dr. Ortega and her colleagues in the Department of Economics for the opportunity to come and speak to you tonight. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I'm particularly excited to have the chance to speak with you about uh, something that I know that for most of my life, I've been in public interest law for nearly 20 years. Uh, but for most of that uh, time and for most of my life, I think that I've given insufficient attention to the question that we're here to talk about tonight, which um, is, in essence, uh, the legitimacy or the lack of legitimacy for America's criminal justice system. I will front load the answer. Um, I'm going to tell you that I think that, unfortunately, our criminal justice system is one that does not, uh, does, no longer merits our trust, our confidence, and our support. I believe that it lacks fundamental integrity. And, um, but I've come to some, some surprising conclusions about why that is. Uh, I think that the idea that there are problems in our criminal justice system is among the most bipartisan uh, perspectives in public policy. But I think that many people um, are putting the emphasis in the wrong place. I think our criminal justice system um, lacks legitimacy and has problems that are uh, ones that are not widely recognized or understood. And that's what I'd like to visit with you about. Uh, tonight. Before I do that, I want to emphasize uh, one thing I think is extraordinarily important, and it's this. Among the most important institutions in any society, I believe, is a well-functioning criminal justice system. Why is that? It is necessary in any large group of people to have a shared understanding of what kind of conduct is acceptable and what is not. And you also have to have some kind of a mechanism for protecting peaceful people who simply want to get along with one another, to be productive together, and to respect each other and not violate each other's rights. 
you've got to have some sort of a mechanism to protect those people from people who don't get along, from people who cannot or will not control their behavior and who are unable or unwilling to live in peace with other people. Um, there are various ways uh, that different countries and societies have tried over the years uh, to send that message, what is acceptable and what's not, and to protect peaceful members of society uh, from those who would violate their rights and even do violence to them. And certainly, uh, we're still working on those challenges, uh, but I believe that our criminal justice system has uh, really taken uh, some, some very serious wrong turns. Let me uh, quickly illustrate, uh, if I may, uh, the importance of having a well-functioning criminal justice system, which I would define, I, I should define that term up front. I think that a well-functioning a well criminal justice system has two particular attributes. First, it appropriately punishes those who deserve punishment. And second, it does so in a way that appears to be and people believe to be fair. So it matters both the substance of what it's doing, that it punishes people who deserve punishment and leaves people alone who do not, but also it needs to accomplish those things in a way that is perceived to be fair, so that people believe that they should support the criminal justice system, that it works um, in a way that is fair and produces justice. There are many ways to sort of emphasize how important a well-functioning criminal justice system is, but let me give you a couple of illustrations from a wonderful book called Pirates, Prisoners, and Lepers, Lessons from Life Outside the Law by a law professor named Paul Robinson at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the first illustration that Professor Robinson gives in his book is a description of what happened at a number of communes back in the 60s and 70s that essentially tried to create a society with no criminal justice system. They, they pledged in these communes that there would be no punishment. In fact, it was one of the organizing principles of these communes. Um, I will skip a, a detailed description of what then happened. You can probably, some of you, surmise. Um, but I will say two things. Uh, if you were at one of these communes, two things you would know to a certainty. First, you don't leave any food lying around if it's yours and you ever want to eat it again because it's going to be taken. And second, you would never, under any circumstances, bring a child to one of these communes uh, because these communes tended to attract people who, uh, for whom the prospect of no punishment was extremely um, desirable, um, and they behaved accordingly. And these communes did not work, and in fact, in rather short order, they became extraordinarily unpleasant places to be because they simply had no way to distinguish between good and antisocial behavior and to appropriately punish people um, who, who refused to respect other people's rights and to get along with them peacefully. Another illustration from the book that I find quite evocative um, was Professor Robinson's description of wagon trains moving west on the Oregon Trail. Um, this was an extremely arduous and difficult trip, as I'm sure you know. And it also turned out to be extraordinarily important um, how you timed your departure. Most of these wagon trains um, left from St. Louis, which is sort of the edge of civilization at the time. And it was extraordinarily important when you did that, because if you leave too early, you will encounter snow on the Great Plains. Your oxen will not have any forage to eat. They will die, and you will follow shortly thereafter. If you leave too late, uh, by the time you get to the Rocky Mountains or the Sierra Nevada, it will be fall and there will be snow and you will get stuck. And you might have to eat your companions and then you'll still be stuck. And uh, that actually, of course, happened in one expedition. So it mattered tremendously when you left. And it was a very, very narrow margin. And these wagon trains did not stop for anything. They didn't stop for injuries. They didn't stop for childbirth, for people who got sick, for hunting parties that wandered off. They simply kept forging ahead because they didn't have the time but according to Professor Robinson, guess what? They did stop for one thing and one thing only, and that was a criminal trial. If somebody, was, uh, if somebody had engaged in some misconduct, someone had, had, had killed someone else or stolen their stuff or some, some serious misconduct, the entire wagon train would stop so that they could determine who did what to whom and assess an appropriate punishment. And it was so important and it was so central to holding together these little micro-societies as they were moving west, that if another wagon train came upon the first wagon train while it was doing this you know, investigation and trial, the second wagon train would even stop so they could participate. Uh, so for me, that's a very evocative illustration of just how extraordinarily important having a well-functioning criminal justice system has always been um, perceived to be and, in fact, is. And um, as I said before, I unfortunately have come to the conclusion 
that America's criminal justice system is not functioning properly and does not deserve our trust, our support, and our respect. And I want to take the remaining time to lay out the reasons for that. And there are basically three in my judgment. First, we criminalize far too much conduct and particularly non-wrongful conduct. We, tr we criminalize a tremendous amount of conduct that, that involves people doing things that don't hurt anybody else and don't violate anybody else's rights. And that's what I mean by non-wrongful conduct. And we criminalize a great deal of it. And more than that, we criminalize activity that perfectly decent, otherwise law-abiding citizens wish to engage in and will continue to engage in, notwithstanding the fact that it is illegal. Uh, and so in effect, what we do is we turn large numbers of citizens who are peaceful, decent people into criminals simply by defining particular activities that they wish to engage in as crimes. And I'll, get, I'll elaborate on each of these in a moment. The second thing that we've done to undermine America's criminal justice system, we've taken the very heart of it, the cornerstone, the key innovation that made America's criminal justice system different from the criminal justice systems of almost every other country in the world, and that, that was absolutely essential to a fair and apparently fair process. In other words, a process that delivers fair results and that has the, fair, the appearance of fairness. And what is this cornerstone? What is the heart of the American criminal justice system and the thing that makes it so unique? It is the criminal jury trial. It is the constitutional provision for public participation in the criminal justice system, public participation in passing judgment on other citizens, absolutely central to the American criminal justice system, and we have taken it, the criminal jury trial, and we have ripped it right out of the system. It barely exists anymore, and it has been a disaster. And the last thing that we've done is we have created what amounts to a policy of zero, or if you want to quibble, near zero accountability for law enforcement. So all of this, the investigation of crimes, the prosecution of crimes, the punishment of people who have been convicted, all of this takes place in an atmosphere of near zero accountability for those who enforce, prosecute, uh, the law, enforce and prosecute the laws and administer the punishments. When you add these three, these three things up, the first I refer to as unconstitutional overcriminalization. Second, the practical elimination of citizen participation in the, in the criminal justice system by practically eliminating criminal jury trials, and our policy of near zero accountability for law enforcement, all of that adds up to a criminal justice system that I no longer consider to be uh, legitimate and that I don't believe deserves our support. All right, let's take each, each of those and look at them a little more carefully. One thing that we, I think we, we fail to do as often as we should is to ask the following question. What limits, if any, are there on the government's ability to criminalize particular kinds of conduct. Um, so the Constitution, which I have here in my hand, the Cato Pocket Constitution, I commend it to you, um, does list a number of constitutional rights, and those are probably some of the easiest. So for example, could the government ban Harry Potter books? And this is not whimsical. I mean, it's whimsical, but it's not, um, it's, it's not completely unrealistic. There have certainly been states and local jurisdictions that have banned books from time to time. And I suspect most Americans, perhaps not all, but most Americans would immediately recognize that there's at least a concern there. Uh, banning books is, is something that I think most of us probably realize there's, there's probably some limit on that. Maybe there's, there's perhaps even something in the Constitution about that. And of course there is. The First Amendment provides that no, uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Uh, and that has been interpreted to extend to books. So that's pretty easy. The government doesn't get to ban books. But believe it or not, it actually gets pretty hard after that. There aren't that many things in the text of the Constitution that are explicitly uh, protected. And so when we get into conduct and activities that are not obviously covered by any specific provision in the Constitution, things start to get a bit murkier. And one of the most significant questions, I would say, in all of constitutional law is whether the government has to have a good reason to put you in a cage. Let me say that again. Does the government have to have a good reason to put you in a cage? Morally and philosophically, there is a very obvious and clear answer to that, and the answer is emphatically yes. 
from the standpoint of constitutional doctrine, which is to say constitutional law as interpreted by the Supreme Court, there is an equally clear answer, and it is no. In general, the, the government does not have to have a good reason to put Americans in cages. And how do we know that? Well, how, the way we know that is that the Supreme Court has chosen as its default setting in terms of the standard that it applies when it reviews laws for constitutionality, an utterly toothless standard called the rational basis test, which is nothing more than a judicial rubber stamp. It is a fraud and a charade. Um, and by the way, I used to litigate these cases in my old job as a constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice. Uh, um, I, I litigated these cases for 15 years and then wrote a book about it. Uh, you might even say that I am sort of the Captain Ahab of the rational basis test. I've sort of been chasing it around the constitutional planet trying to get a harpoon into it. Um, but it is an extraordinarily pernicious bit of constitutional doctrine that essentially says to courts, if somebody challenges a particular law, including some criminal law, and I'll give you some, you know, some illustrations in a second, um, essentially what you should do as a judge, unless it implicates some specifically articulated right in the Constitution like free speech or religion, then what you should do as a judge is you should go through the motions of evaluating the constitutionality of that law, but knowing all along that you're just going to end up rubber stamping it and saying that it's fine. So for example, um, the, um, the, the Supreme Court in 1986 considered the question of whether the government may put you in a cage um, for having sex with somebody of your own gender. Does anybody know what the Supreme Court said the first time it looked at this case in 1986? The case called Bowers v. Hardware from Georgia, and the Supreme Court said, in essence, well, of course you can. Um, there's nothing in the Constitution about sex, certainly nothing about gay sex, and so it's an easy case. In 2003, um, just 17 years later, the Supreme Court looked at that again in a case called Lawrence v. Texas from my host home state. I'm from Texas. Texas had a similar law in the books. And the Supreme Court this time turned around, uh, did an about face and said, actually, no, come to think of it, you can't put somebody in jail for having sex with somebody of the same gender. Uh, and this represents a fairly, a relatively rare instance of the Supreme Court uh, taking an activity uh, that is not in any way specifically referenced in the Constitution and actually going to bat for it in a meaningful way. But usually what the courts do is they simply rubber stamp whatever law it is that, that the government wants to pass. Let me give you an example. There is, as we speak, believe it or not, a law going through the South Carolina legislature right now that would make it a crime to wear loose pants that come down far enough to expose your underwear. Now, I think probably everybody in the room understands that this is not a public safety issue. This is rather obviously a cultural issue. But stop and think for a moment. What interest does the government possibly have in forbidding people for, who choose to wear their pants that way from doing so and in punishing people if they disregard that law? And I'm here to tell you that if that law passes, I hope it doesn't, I, I kind of doubt that it will, but there are some jurisdictions as we speak that do have such laws in the books. I am not sure which way the courts would go on that law in terms of whether they would strike it down as a violation of the Constitution because they tend to be quite myopic. And what judges typically do is they simply pick up the Constitution, they look at it and they say, well, nothing in here about wearing clothes and certainly nothing in here about wearing loose clothes, so none of my business. That is an extraordinarily defective way to do constitutional law, but it is the way that the courts typically uh, do constitutional law. Uh, most of my background as a constitutional litigator was in um, occupational licensing. So I'm a lawyer. I have to have a license to do that. My sister's a doctor in Maine. That requires a license. What has happened over the last 30 or 40 years is that there's been occupational licensing creep. Uh, and the sheer number of occupations that are now licensed is mind-boggling, and uh, many of them quite harmless, quite innocent, I think rather obviously licensed for no other reason than to, uh, for economic protectionism, uh, for the entrenched interests. But interestingly enough, some of these occupational licensing laws are actually criminal laws as well. So one of the last big cases I had at the Institute for Justice was challenging Florida's law. Florida is one of just three states where you have to have uh, a license from the state, which in turn requires a college degree in order to be an interior designer. I'm not making that up. It is a crime to practice interior design in Florida without a license. No one has ever been hurt in the entire history of the world from unlicensed interior design. 
The 47 states that do not license interior design, including California, New York, and Texas, there's never been any problems there. Uh, it's 100% clear that this law is about economic protectionism. It's basically about excluding interior designers from places like California and New York. Um, there are very good interior designers in those states, and there's a lot of really choice work to do in Florida. The local Florida interior designers do not wish to compete with California and New York interior designers, and they've essentially put up a wall around the state. Well, we challenge that law in court, and as I have suggested to you, notwithstanding the fact that it carries criminal penalties, you can get in a lot of trouble for practicing interior design in Florida without a license, the courts rubber stamped it. In the absence of any evidence that it does anything good for anybody, and in the absence of any evidence that there is any real public policy or public con uh, welfare concerns at stake. Um, and that is absolutely part and parcel of how our courts approach criminal laws. And of course, um, I, I've been not addressing the elephant in the room, so let me jump right to it. Um, we are now in the midst of an a, a ongoing national experiment uh, about whether to decriminalize marijuana. Um, since the 1930s, marijuana uh, has been uh, criminal, uh, has been the possession or distribution of marijuana has been a uh, crime under federal law um, and in most states. But what's happening now is that the states are going in another direction. About 29 states have either uh, wholly or partially decriminalized marijuana, um, and yet the federal government continues to maintain uh, the federal prohibition on marijuana. And, and what's happening is the states are diverging from the federal government in a way that's quite extraordinary. Uh, and I would say, I think, the, I think the jury is still out. We, don't, we still don't probably have enough uh, uh, data to, to make uh, sort of a firm conclusion about this new policy. But I personally believe, um, and I'm not in any way a proponent, by the way. I'm libertarian, but that's not my thing. Um, but uh, I'm interested in it because uh, people are still paying an extraordinarily uh, huge price. Some people are paying a huge price for their choice to, um, for example, disregard federal marijuana law. And the experiment that we're in the middle of is, is essentially determining, you know, is there any real basis for criminalizing marijuana, whether possession or distribution? Uh, my reading of the results so far, they've been somewhat mixed. There's been some benefits. There's probably been some costs. But there's been no major problems with legalization in any of the states that have done it, which tends to suggest that there was no really good reason for criminalizing it in the first place. Uh, let me give you an example, but, but we continue to do it under federal law, and the feds, believe it or not, still continue to prosecute marijuana crimes. Not so much possession, but definitely production, which is their way of saying growing it, and distribution. Does anybody have any idea? So there's these things called the federal sentencing guidelines, and essentially says to judges, this is what the presumptive penalty should be for, for violating various laws. Um, does anybody want to take a crack at what is the the guidelines penalty for growing a thousand or more plants of uh, uh, marijuana plants. So if you happen to be doing that, you've got some extra land, you are, are pretty good, you got yourself a, a really green thumb, and you're growing a thousand marijuana plants, and the federal government decides they want to come in and bust you for that, the minimum penalty under federal law is 20 years in prison. And the maximum penalty for that is life in prison and federal judges hand out decades like Halloween candy for these kinds of crimes. It is an extraordinarily serious thing to be caught growing a bunch of marijuana in this country at the very same time that you may live in a state that says, we have no problem with it. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of divergence. And it also emphasizes the point I made earlier uh, that the courts are allowing the government to criminalize conduct and impose extraordinarily harsh penalties on people who have done nothing fundamentally wrong. They have not invaded anybody else's rights. They have not hurt anybody. They have done nothing more than simply live peacefully and in some cases grow a bunch of marijuana in their backyard, either for themselves or for others. And that is the kind of system that we live in, where we have, uh, and by the way, a majority of Americans now support decriminalization of marijuana, but Congress hasn't moved on it because it's difficult to appear to be soft on crime, which is how they perceive um, any kind of move in the direction of lenity. And so uh, that's an example uh, of, of where we are. And I'm here to tell you the feds absolutely prosecute these crimes. In fact, there was a case that just came down from the Federal Court of Appeals in New York where a father and son were uh, arrested for what, what was apparently a rather substantial marijuana grow operation in upstate New York. And uh, they were charged with growing more than 1,000 marijuana plants, conspiracy to distribute, 
uh, and a number of other charges. And when the son insisted upon his speedy trial rights, the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution guarantees you a right to a speedy and public trial, um, they thought that was so crazy because his father was offered a plea deal. I don't know what the, the plea deal was actually. They knocked it down from 1,000 marijuana plants to 50, which is a much, much lighter penalty. His father probably got maybe a year or two. So that was the deal his father took. And when the son refused to even enter into any kind of plea negotiation, insisted on going to trial, this was thought to be so extraordinary that on the basis of nothing else than his insistence on going to trial, they had him sent out for a mental competency exam. And then when he came back with a clean bill of health and, and insisted again on going to trial and not negotiating a plea, they thought that was so strange. Uh, and then, oh, and this time he insisted he was going to represent himself. Well, that was so strange, they sent him out for another mental competency exam. And then they did it a third time. And because this is New York, this didn't happen quickly. This poor man languished in jail for seven years before he ever got a trial. Seven years of procedural maneuvering because it so flummoxed the court system and the prosecutors that anybody would insist upon their speedy trial rights and not take the rather sweet offer that, that had been um, uh, sent his way by way of a plea. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit on the plea bargain, um, but I wanted to... Um, I wanted to touch base on a couple of other things. Um, the, um, one of the ways I think we know that, uh, for example, the drug war is a public policy to which we as a country are only somewhat committed um, is, and I would love to do this as a natural experiment, I don't think it's likely to be possible, but if anybody in this room finds himself in a position to do it, please do. I posit that the President of the United States could end the drug war within the year even if Congress disagreed, in other words, even if Congress did not want to change the law, I posit that the president could do it with one, by doing one thing, instructing the U.S. Department of Justice to devote as much effort and as many resources at interdicting drugs on college campuses as they do in inner cities. We absolutely have the stomach for sending the fathers and sons and mothers and daughters of the inner city off to prison for decades for drug crimes. I am absolutely confident that we do not have the stomach to send the sons and daughters and siblings of doctors and lawyers and senators and others whose children go to college. And I haven't been on campus for very long, so I won't even surmise. Um, I have been on campus in some, at some schools out east, and there's a lot of drug activity in many of those schools. And the feds know it, and law enforcement knows it, and they by and large leave it alone. Because the drug war is one that we are not serious about waging, and it represents a policy to which we are not truly committed as a country. Um, and yet, and yet, law enforcement continues to wage this war with pitiless violence. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. So one of the problems I think that we have uh, in the system is one of incentives. If you think about the incentives that members of law enforcement face, if you're a police officer, you have to show that you're productive in some way. That essentially boils down to the number of arrests or citations that you issue. Um, talk to anybody that you know in law enforcement. Um, my experience, at least, is they will tell you they are expected to come back from the end of a shift with a certain amount of citations or arrests. And otherwise, if they don't come back with that. They are thought to have not had a very productive shift. So we've got this incentive that they're out there. We've got these thousands and thousands and thousands of laws that are available to enforce. Um, I assume most of you know this. You, you really can't operate a motor vehicle for more than about 30 seconds without committing an infraction. So that's available. Uh, and so we have all of these um, uh, different infractions and crimes that people can commit at any given time. And we've got law enforcement out in the field with very strong incentives to find something, anything, uh, that they can, they can charge you with, whether it's a traffic infraction or um, even jaywalking or, or, or some uh, crime that they can arrest you for just to show that they're productive. Prosecutors, too, have to be productive. And the basic way that prosecutors uh, demonstrate their productivity is by getting convictions. Uh, there's no real other way to show that you're being productive as a prosecutor. And so these are the incentives uh, that law enforcement face. And this makes the rest of us very vulnerable, because every time you find yourself in the presence of a police officer or a prosecutor, um, they've essentially, whether formally or informally, they've got a quota to meet. And every minute that they spend talking to you, is a, is a kind of a sunk cost. That's a minute they spent during their shift um, for which they are not going to be able to show anything uh, if they don't issue a citation or make an arrest. Um, now, that doesn't, I don't know what everybody's individual experiences with police officers have been. Mine have generally been pretty good. Uh, but that's not the experience of most people in this country. 
And unfortunately, we have vulnerable populations. We have populations that are targeted by police. Um, we have uh, extraordinary racial disparities in much of our criminal justice system. And so there are many people um, whose encounters with police officers are much more fraught and much more dangerous uh, than, um, and dangerous by dangerous, I mean not just sort of physically dangerous that you might be hurt, uh, but dangerous in the sense that you might be talking to somebody who views their basic job while they're having an interaction with you to find some way to arrest you or to find some way to charge you with something because that's what they're expected to do in order to appear productive. There were about 11 million arrests um, in the last year for which we have statistics, which is 2016. That's a lot of arrests. Um, and of course, every one of those arrests has to go through the system. Every one of those arrests causes uh, or, or uh, consumes resources. And I was astonished, I mean astonished, um, by the following uh, figures that I'm going to quote for you. The um, national clearance rate for homicide, so clearance means that's when the, um, the police department closes the, the investigation. That, that, that signifies that they believe they've solved the crime, they found the person who did it, etc. The national clearance rate for homicide in this country is 61.4%. In most urban areas, it's well below 50%. In Baltimore, it's below 20%. There is a very good chance if you commit a homicide in this country that you will get away with it. For all violent crimes combined, for all violent crimes combined, the national clearance rate is below 50%. And for property crimes, the national clearance rate is below 20%. And yet, and yet, in 2016, there were more arrests for marijuana-related offenses than for all violent crimes combined. Let me say that again. In 2016, there were more arrests for marijuana-related offenses than for all violent crimes combined, notwithstanding those abysmal clearance rates that I just shared with you. How on earth could that be? And my theory is that the marijuana arrests and other drug arrests represent low-hanging fruit. It is a lot easier to arrest somebody for drug possession or distribution than it is to solve a homicide or a rape or a robbery. Uh, among other things, people who engage in those kinds of uh, actions are, are very careful to try to hide their tracks. Well, not always, but usually very careful to hide their tracks. It's a very serious crime. Uh, and it's also kind of hard to cajole somebody into committing a homicide. It's hard to suggest to somebody that maybe they'd like to go and do an armed robbery today. But it turns out to be very easy to do that uh, with drug crimes, um, to cajole somebody into going and buying drugs and to set them up that way. That happens all the time. I think in part because um, we're increasingly, as a country, I think most of us are increasingly losing faith in the drug war. We're less and less convinced that drug prohibition has accomplished anything good or that it should be enforced anymore. And so, People who violate various drug laws, they don't get, generally speaking, a lot of social pushback. And I think probably for most of us, if your friends discovered that you've got a side business of, of, uh, of robbing uh, you know, grocery stores or banks, you'd probably get some social pushback on that. You'd probably get some disapproval from your circle of friends. But I suspect that most people who, uh, who do drugs and, and even people who sell them you get a lot of pushback for that. You don't get a lot of social disapproval. What you do get is a tremendous amount of, of attention from law enforcement. Um, one of the most vivid and I think um, telling images of sort of the modern era is every once in a while uh, on Twitter, you'll see um, a police department with a picture of a table and there will be uh, you know, a dozen or two or three dozen plastic bags full of marijuana and the heroic officers who achieved this bust will be standing behind it and they'll say, this department congratulates officers so and so and so and so, you know, for their tremendous police work and taking whatever it is, 10 pounds of marijuana off the streets. Has anybody ever seen this? Does anybody, does anybody know what Twitter then does? What does Twitter collectively then do in response? They mock this department. The floodgates of contempt and ridicule open up as people say, oh, I feel so much safer that you were able to get 10 whole pounds of marijuana off the streets, right? And poor, you know, those poor Domino's delivery guys who won't be so busy tonight because of that. Um, and it's, it's amazing, it's, it really is worth seeing. In fact, I don't usually like to do PowerPoint, but if I was going to do a PowerPoint, I would go and get one of those tweets and show it to you because the outpouring of mockery and derision that comes from sort of the general Twitter community, which I'm not saying is you know, uh, representative necessarily, um, I think is incredibly telling as is the utter tone deafness 
of these police departments, they still don't get it. They still don't get that, that, you know, with the exception maybe of the parents of those officers, nobody is very proud of that bust. And most people wonder, was there not something else you could have been doing that might actually have made the community safer during that time? And so, unfortunately, that's where we've gotten to. 11 million arrests, more arrests for marijuana-related offenses than for all violent crimes combined. I think the incentives are perverse. I think the incentives are misaligned. And I think we could be doing a lot better. Now, um, let's move from uh, over-criminalization. Let's move from the government making it illegal to do things that don't hurt anybody, that don't violate anybody's rights, that don't particularly make the community worse. So we've talked about that. The government criminalizes a tremendous amount of conduct that doesn't make our lives any work worse and doesn't make our communities any less safe, and then puts a tremendous amount of resources into policing those useless crimes, those pointless crimes. Let's talk about what then happens when you find yourself in the system, because this is really where it gets particularly horrifying. Um, at the founding era, criminal justice, the criminal justice system and, and the procedures were, were simple and straightforward. And virtually nobody hired a lawyer to represent them in criminal cases because a criminal trial was short and sweet. You showed up, the government, usually there weren't even professional prosecutors, the government hired some lawyer to come in and, and represent the government. Um, if you had any witnesses, you put your witnesses on the stand, they put their witnesses on the stand, and you know, in a few hours, you got a decision from the jury about whether you'd committed that crime or not. Very straightforward. And uh, virtually nobody um, uh, uh, was represented by a lawyer. In 2018, it is completely the opposite. Not only does virtually nobody um, uh, represent themselves anymore, virtually everybody has a lawyer, the process has become so complex that you really would be almost crazy. Like, remember that story I told you about the guy who kept saying he wanted to represent himself? They weren't wrong to wonder if he was okay in the head. I mean, they were wrong. He wasn't, uh, you know, didn't have any mental um, impairments. But you wouldn't be wrong for supposing that somebody who thought that they, in representing themselves in a criminal case without counsel, would be entering into anything like a level playing field for that adjudication is absolutely wrong. Um, criminal law, and particularly criminal procedure, has become extraordinarily complex. And I think it is fair to say that unless you are a professional criminal defense attorney, you really have no business trying to represent anybody, including yourself, um, in a modern day uh, criminal trial. The other thing that was unknown at the time of the founding was something that's become very much a part of our system, and that's plea bargaining. There were no plea bargains at the, at the founding. Occasionally, someone would show up at their trial on the first day and say, you know, my conscience just compels me to say, I did it. I'm guilty. I did it. Um, and then there would be, you know, sentence would be passed. But they didn't do the kind of haggling and the back and forth, which I'm going to describe to you in just a moment. Um, and so... Our criminal justice system has really uh, transformed because, I'm going to give you some more statistics, plea bargaining has come to almost completely displace the criminal jury trial. And that is extraordinarily problematic for a number of reasons. Um, what you get with criminal jury trials is not only a better process. I think you get a better process because it's always important to have people from outside the system, to have people who are not jaded, who are not cynical, who don't see the same things every day, uh, you know, because they work in a court system or because they work in law enforcement, it's important to bring in a bunch of people who don't participate in that system or are not fixtures of that system. The Greeks, by the way, called this sortition. The idea of bringing non-professionals into policy making or into, into some aspect of policy, and they thought it was really important. And so did the framers of our Constitution. If you read the Bill of Rights, you will not fail to notice the central place of the criminal jury trial in our uh, criminal justice system. But what we've done now is we've basically crowded out criminal jury trials with plea bargaining. Um, today, 97% of federal criminal convictions are obtained through plea bargain. 97% of federal criminal convictions are obtained through plea bargain. In the states, it's about 95 or 96%. Here's a question that every single American should be asking themselves and that should frankly keep you awake at night, and that is this. Why on earth does almost nobody in this country choose to exercise one of the most hallowed and hard fought for and unique rights in the entire Constitution? What on earth could discourage people or dissuade them from exercising a right 
that the founders of this country fought hard to put at the very center of our criminal justice system, and there is a very simple answer, and the answer is this, coercive plea bargaining. Plea bargaining is a misnomer. There's no bargaining. What happens when you do it with a plea negotiation or with pleas is the prosecutor brings the full might of the government, whether it's the US government, the state of California, or any other state, that prosecutor brings the full might of the government to bear on a particular person with one goal in mind, and that is to get that person to accept a deal and confess their guilt and declare themselves to be guilty, and, and then you can go straight into the punishment phase. Why is that? Well, I think there are several reasons. Criminal juries, and I used to be a trial lawyer early on in my career, jury trials are expensive. You have to get, you have to find 12 people who don't know anything about the case and are not disqualified for any other reason. They have to sit um, not doing whatever job they have for however long it takes to resolve that case. Uh, the court has to operate at a sort of a higher staffing level than normal, so they have to bring in bailiffs and clerks and all these other things. Uh, and so criminal jury trials are expensive. They are time consuming. They are inefficient. And from the prosecutor's standpoint, worst of all, they are uncertain. Jury trials inject an unacceptable measure of uncertainty into the process, unacceptable to prosecutors. Um, and so I just want to quickly sort of summarize the basic tools that are available to a prosecutor in the coercive plea bargaining process. The first one is this, and I alluded to it a moment ago. It is the very complexity of the system. You have no realistic ability to navigate that complexity by yourself. It can only be done, functionally, it can only be done by somebody who is experienced in, in defending criminal cases, an experienced criminal defense attorney. What we do next is we make the process so complicated, so expensive, and we limit the number of people who can actually practice law uh, through the cartelization of the bar and so forth, that criminal defense is extraordinarily expensive. Very few people have the money to pay for their own criminal defense attorney. 80%, 80% of people who go through this process, uh, criminal prosecution, have a government appointed and paid for lawyer, 80%. Uh, I was sharing at lunch with some people today. Um, Cato had a very distinguished federal judge that came and participated in a panel back in November. His name is Jed Rakoff. Uh, he's been a federal judge in Manhattan, uh, the Southern District of New York, which is one of the most highly respected judicial districts in the country. And uh, Judge Rakoff, as part of this panel, offered an estimate of what he thought was about the average cost of a an appropriately zealously litigated white collar criminal defense. So if the government charges you with some business related crime, that's a white collar crime. Judge Rakoff, Judge Rakoff estimated the average expense of a, of a reasonably zealous defense to a white collar crime. I'm gonna ask the audience, I know this might uh, be a glitch because we're being recorded, but I really wanna see if anybody can come up with this figure. I have asked this question probably a dozen times. No one has ever come close. Anybody wanna throw out a figure? a reasonably zealously litigated white collar defense against the Department of Justice, the federal government. What is it? 300,000, it's higher. A million, higher. Higher than 10 million. $20 million was his estimate. And uh, we actually had um, uh, another panel not, there, not long after. We, we had the CEO of a medical device company that had been targeted by prosecution, for, for prosecution by the DOJ. The case is too complex to try to describe it to you, but the gist of it was that they claimed that his company was using uh, a varicose vein fixing kit for some other purpose than the uh, uh, Federal Drug Administration had approved it for. Um, that turned out to be wrong, but that was their claim. And they went after him, and the process took about seven years. He's written a book about it. Um, his name is Howard Root. This is one of the best books that I've read in the last five years, so I'll commend it to your attention. Howard Root, Cardiac Arrest, uh, something like my seven years on the Fed's hit list. But all you need to know is cardiac arrest by Howard Root. Seven years, he fought, and fortunately he's on really good terms with the company's board of directors and the company's doing pretty well, so they authorized the company to spend whatever it took to defend him. Uh, he ended up actually going um, to a jury trial, which almost nobody does. Um, ironically enough, or, or um, um, coincidentally, in front of the judge that I clerked for when I got out of law school, uh, Royce Lamberth, who's uh, from Texas, but he's a judge in D.C. and he moonlights in San Antonio, which is where the case was. And this man was acquitted. And not only was he acquitted by the jury, but the jury, after they saw the way the government had gone after him, uh, they were so incensed that they came up to him afterwards and essentially apologized that this had been done to him. 
total cost of his defense to defend himself against this baseless prosecution was $25 million. $25 million. So most people who go through our system are represented by public defenders. In the federal system, they're pretty good. In the states, it's a much dicier proposition. Some federal, uh, some, not federal, some public defenders in states carry a caseload of up to 300 or more cases. It is simply impossible to provide a fully zealous representation to each of your clients when you have that kind of a caseload. And guess who knows that? Prosecutors. So the prosecutor knows that he or she has virtually unlimited resources, including full access to investigators in the form of police and other law enforcement. Um, they also have access to the fact that the police is, are the ones who've done the investigation from the beginning, so they have access to all that information. And they have the ability to bring the full weight of the government to bear on that defendant. What does that defendant, ha defendant have? A government paid for lawyer who doesn't have any investigator, who has a, uh, a docket of sometimes hundreds of cases um, and is plainly outmatched in terms of resources. Unfortunately, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The number of ways that prosecutors have to make the playing field unlevel and to coerce a plea bargain go on and on and on, but I want to hit on, I want to touch on a couple more. Under federal law, it is a felony. It is a felony to provide any witness with a thing of value in exchange for their testimony. It's bribery. And there's a very good reason for this. Because witnesses who have been induced to testify for one side or the other in a trial may manufacture their testimony in exchange for the thing of value. As uh, Alan Dershowitz, who's a famous law professor at Harvard and a criminal defense attorney, put it, a witness who has been bribed or a witness who has been paid for their testimony may not only sing, they may also compose. <laughs> there is one group of people in this country to whom that statute does not apply and who are not only permitted to bribe witnesses, but routinely bribe witnesses, and it is part and parcel of the way they do criminal law. Does anybody want to guess who these people are? They are called prosecutors. Prosecutors are specifically authorized to bribe witnesses and are not bound by this law, and they do it all the time. What is the number one thing that prosecutors use to bribe witnesses? That's right, less jail time. They drop charges, they recommend uh, less jail time to judges at sentencing, et cetera, et cetera. And I would put to you that that is even more valuable to many people than money. I can't think of a sum of money that I would take in exchange for 10 years in prison. And, and, and they offer those kinds of deals all the time. That is bribery. And it has all of the same risks that prompted Congress to make it a felony. And a very clever criminal defense attorney uh, about 10 years ago, now more like 15 years ago, had this light bulb go on in his head and he said, hey, wait a minute. This law doesn't exempt prosecutors. There's nothing in here that says that they get to do this. And, and, and dropping charges or re re recommending reduced time, that's absolutely a thing of value. And he brought it up in the context of a case he was defending. He was defending a woman who had been charged with, I can't remember what it was, some kind of business fraud or something like that. And he said, you know, this federal law doesn't make any exception for prosecutors. They're not allowed to do this. And uh, the trial judge did what trial judges usually do with new theories and said, that's none of my business. Take that upstairs to the Court of Appeals. So he did, and the Court of Appeals agreed with him. The 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals that covers Colorado and Kansas and a few other western states, they agreed. And the, Depart the U.S. Department of Justice went completely bonkers. There was no way they could, they could take this sitting down because this is how they practice law. This is how prosecutors do what they do. So they filed a motion asking for the entire Tenth Circuit to hear the case. Uh, federal courts of appeals generally hear cases in groups of three judges. They said to the Tenth Circuit, we need all of you to get together and reconsider this ruling. And the Tenth Circuit reversed, sitting on bonk, meaning all the court, they reversed and said, well, technically there's no exception for prosecutors in the statute, but they really need, this is, how, this is how prosecutors do what they do. So we're just going to read one into the law. So um, this is something that, that prosecutors have the ability to do. They have the ability to, you know, um, essentially, I know that, well, they're not supposed to do it, and I'm pretty confident that most of them don't do it, but sometimes they do it. They essentially have the ability to amplify their case, to manufacture missing testimony when they need it. Again, they're not supposed to do it. It's an ethical violation if they do do it, but we have anecdotal evidence that it happens more often than you might think. Highly problematic. Another thing that's not uncommon for prosecutors is to threaten the friends and family members of defendants. Uh, so for example, uh, if uh, you know, they find some drugs in your house, um, in your closet, 
and they want you to take a plea, and you dig in your heels and say, you know what, um, I've got some pretty good defenses. Maybe the police shouldn't have been in there. They didn't have a warrant to come in the house. I'm going to fight this one. Not at all unusual for prosecutors to say something like this. Well, now, that's not your house, is it? That's just your room in the house, but your mom, she lives in that house too, doesn't she? So technically, she was really responsible for the fact that these drugs were in the house. You know what? Maybe we need to go and indict your mom. What do you think about that? Happens all the time. It happens all the time. The other thing they can do is they can intimidate defense witnesses. It can, and, and it runs a whole gamut. They can say things like, oh, so you're, you're coming to testify in support of your friend so-and-so. You know, um, you probably know this, but you might not. You've got a warrant out for your arrest. Man, it would sure be a shame if you got picked up after you got done testifying. You know, some police officer was hanging around outside the courthouse and realized you had a warrant and took you off to jail. That would be a real shame, wouldn't it? Um, did you know, by the way, you're not under subpoena, so you actually don't need to come? Just throwing that out there. It has even happened that the Department of Justice um, has uh, picked up uh, witnesses who are not in the country lawfully, but were, you know, on somebody's list. Like, you know, my friend Miguel is going to come and testify on my behalf in my criminal trial, and guess what happens to Miguel? He gets deported. That has happened. Not just accidentally, but deported because, hey, you know what would actually make our lives easier as prosecutors? If Miguel was back in his, in his country of origin, because he wouldn't be able to testify on your behalf. Uh, as I suggested earlier, unfortunately, I could go on and on, but I have one more point that I want to make before we go to questions, and that is that, um, so let me sum up the coercive part. It is not an accident, it is not remotely an accident that 97% um, percent of federal criminal convictions are obtained through plea bargain and that the percentage is almost as high in the states and that most Americans do not exercise their constitutional right to a criminal jury trial. It's not because they don't want to. It's not because they don't understand how important it is. It's because we've created a system in which prosecutors have the ability to coerce, and I would even go so far as to say extort, a plea bargain out of nearly everybody who goes through the process. And that is extraordinarily, extraordinarily problematic. Um, I, the jury uh, pr serves so many other functions than just evaluating the quality of the evidence, although that's really important. As I said before, one of the functions they serve is what the Greeks called sortition. It, it involves bringing people who are not part of the system, who are not part of the criminal justice system, they don't have any particular dog in the fight, they bring them into the system so that they also are part of passing judgment on people who have been accused of crimes. They also bring with them transparency. Jurors get to hear, for example, about what was involved in this investigation. In the Howard Root case, for example, the jury got to hear about the ways that the prosecutors had threatened and intimidated witnesses, and they were very put off by that. If the case doesn't go to trial, that information never comes to light, and we don't know about it. Jurors also provide extraordinarily important feedback. There are some parts of the country where prosecutors simply will not file uh, simple drug possession charges because they have learned that they cannot get criminal convictions in front of juries. And once the local public defense, or once the local criminal defense bar knows that, they start encouraging their clients not to take plea deals and say, look, it's simple possession, go to trial, there's a really good chance the jury will acquit. That, by, that, by the way, is called nullification. When juries uh, uh, acquit a defendant who is obviously factually guilty, but who in their judgment does not deserve to be punished, um, and it is a, it is a long-standing part of the Anglo-American legal tradition. It goes back more than 1,000 years. Um, I think it's a very important part of the, um, of the criminal justice system, but, but jurors not only never hear about it, judges never permit criminal defense attorneys to talk about it, they, uh, judges will even permit prosecutors to ask during jury selection, uh, voir dire, has anybody heard, ever heard of nullification? And if so, do you have a favorable opinion of it? If you raise your hand, you're off that jury. So, um, so they, the, the prosecutors kind of um, have all the cards. Here's, here's the analogy I like to give, by the way, of what, what is at stake when you eliminate the criminal, uh, the criminal jury trial from the system. I, I liken it to the following. Imagine you had some kind of godlike power over the environment, and for whatever reason, you just didn't like insects. You got bit by a mosquito, and maybe you got stung by a bee, and you also know that mosquitoes carry disease. You don't really understand how the system works, but you've got virtually omnipotent power over it, and so you just one day decide, you know what, I'm going to eliminate all insects from the ecosystem. We know exactly what would start to happen because we understand some of the roles that insects play in that system. Plants would begin to die, trees would stop fruiting, fa uh, flora would stop reproducing, many animal species that depend on insects would start dying. That is precisely what we have done, in my judgment, by eliminating the criminal jury trial. The criminal jury trial plays the same role in our criminal ecosystem that something like insects play in our natural ecosystem. And the effects on our criminal justice system have been every bit as disastrous 
as the elimination of some key component of the ecosystem would be. And we can't even begin to appreciate the ways that the practical elimination of the criminal jury trial has undermined our criminal justice system. The last thing I want to talk to you about is what I mentioned near the beginning, and that is the fact that everything that I've just been talking about, uh, the overcriminalization, um, the perverse incentives, the practical elimination of the criminal jury trial, all of this takes place in an atmosphere of near zero accountability for law enforcement. There are really only three ways to hold a, a government official accountable for misconduct. Criminal prosecution, so a police officer who, you know, there was actually, a, there was a terrible video of a police officer in Philadelphia. Um, you know, this is being recorded on somebody's camera. It's not entirely sure what the setup is, but um, there's about seven or eight Philadelphia police uh, surrounding a, a young black male who's been uh, handcuffed. And he either says something to one of the police or for whatever reason, one of the police officers takes something amiss, picks him up. He's sitting on the ground in cuffs behind his back. The police officer picks him up, lifts him up over his head and drops him head first onto a above ground swimming pool. And when that young man arrived at the hospital about an hour later, he was in critical condition. There is a very minimal chance that that police officer will be criminally prosecuted, even for that, even though it was caught on tape. Some of you may remember, um, and by the way, uh, so it is very rare for police officers to be criminally prosecuted, and when they are, it's almost impossible to get a conviction. Does anybody remember the shooting where um, a, a South Carolina police officer named Michael Slager shot a fleeing black man named Walter Scott seven times in the back? This is on videotape. A lot of people don't know what then happened. What then happened is that he was prosecuted, and that video was played in court, it's one of the most cold-blooded killings you can imagine. That man was fleeing, not a threat. There was a hung jury. That jury refused to convict that police officer. Um, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Slager, the police officer, is in fact going to go to prison, but only because the feds got involved and charged him with civil rights violations and extracted a plea in which he's going to serve at least 20 years. In fact, he was sentenced to 20 years by a judge a few weeks ago. So, um, but the, the, so the problem is that the first route of accountability Prosecuting people who actually, uh, law, members of law enforcement who, who commit criminal violations doesn't work. I can get into that during the Q&A, but it doesn't work. It is not a viable mechanism for ensuring accountability. The next mechanism for ensuring accountability is internal disciplinary procedures. In other words, internal affairs investigates police officer about whom a complaint has been filed and then meets out appropriate punishment. Does that work? It does not work. It is a laughing stock. Everybody um, who has any familiarity, even proponents you know, of law enforcement, if they're candid, will acknowledge that doesn't work whatsoever. And that leaves us with one thing, and that is the ability of ordinary individual citizens to bring civil rights cases against uh, police and prosecutors for their misconduct. There is a federal law that is colloquially referred to as Section 1983, uh, and it goes all the way back to Reconstruction. It was uh, first enacted in 1871. It's been, uh, it's been amended since then, but the gist of it, the heart of it, has always been the same, and it says the following. Any person... Uh, acting under color of, of state law, that means any public official, um, not federal, but any state or local public official, who injures a, a person, not just a citizen, but any person, uh, by violating any right that that person has, will be liable to that person. So if a police officer or any other public official violates any right of yours, you have the ability to sue them if you're injured by it. And, you're, and all, all constitutional invasions are injuries, so you have the ability to sue them for it. What the Supreme Court has done to this unequivocal civil rights law that provides everybody whose rights have been violated by public officials, and they have completely undermined it by inventing out of whole cloth a series of what are called immunity doctrines. Um, and I'll just explain a couple of them really quickly. The first one is called qualified immunity. And what qualified immunity says is that instead of being able to sue police and other government officials for violating any of your rights, you can only sue them if it was a clearly established right. The Supreme Court completely invented the terms clearly established, inserted them into the statute, and thereby took a very broad statute that could have been quite effective and made it so narrow that it's virtually impossible to sue a police officer anymore, and, and, and here's why. In order for a right to be clearly established, you have to go and show that in the jurisdiction, the relevant jurisdiction, so here we're in California, if it was a federal case, you'd have to find a Ninth Circuit case, uh, because that's the Federal Court of Appeals that covers this region. You have to find a case that is directly on point, where some police officer did exactly the same thing to someone else, and a judge said, nope, that's not okay, that's a violation of their constitutional rights. And virtually any alteration of facts will be sufficient for the, um, for, the, for the police officer to claim qualified immunity. 
Um, and I could give you a whole list of really horrifying cases, but it is absolutely commonplace uh, for judges to say um, in a case, okay, your constitutional rights were definitely violated that, by that police officer, but there wasn't any case directly on point, so he couldn't have known that. He couldn't have been on notice, and therefore, you, you, you can't recover. Therefore, your case is over. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, there was a case recently in Ohio where there had been a, um, a, a motor vehicle chase. Three police cars were chasing a, a, a guy that they thought, um, uh, I think they thought he'd stolen a car that turned out to be wrong. They're chasing him, and he's, you know, he's trying to evade them. They finally managed to get him um, cornered so that all three police cars have him blocked off. And one of the officers, in violation of department policy, um, he's already violated department policy by ramming the car, which he wasn't supposed to do. He gets out, and instead of having the person who's in the, the, the car, the suspect, exit his car, which is the proper way to do it, the police officer approaches the car. Um, and the guy who's driving the car tries to get it in gear, put it in reverse, and back out um, to get away from the police officer. At that point, the police officer pulls his gun and shoots him dead. Absolutely unconstitutional. All, and his family, his uh, uh, survivors, he was killed, but his survivors sued. All three judges in that case held that that was a violation of that man's constitutional rights. You are not allowed to, fl to, to, to use lethal force against a fleeing suspect unless they, they are a, an immediate threat to your life or somebody else's. And he wasn't. He was just trying to back out of there. They killed him anyway. All three judges said that was a violation of that man's constitutional rights, but... We've never had a case in which five police officers surrounded one car that had been chased for two hours on a Thursday night by a guy named Joe, and then they shot him. So, sorry, you don't get to recover. That is what has become of this Section 1983 that was supposed to be the main way, or, or that, was, that really remains the only viable way of holding law enforcement accountable. Um, the Supreme Court has essentially gutted it. By the way, I'm proud to say that the Cato Institute uh, two weeks ago launched a campaign that is targeted specifically at qualified immunity. Um, we're going to be filing friend of the court briefs. We're going to create a survivor's network. We're going to um, uh, take on qualified immunity front and center. We've gotten a tremendous amount of support from across the spectrum. So it's been a, a, extremely gratifying. It'll be a, a real uphill fight because unfortunately the law enforcement lobby is extremely strong. Uh, but uh, we're, we're definitely serious about it. There is one thing, there's one immunity doctrine that is actually, and by the way, there's a bunch that I'll have to leave out, but there is one immunity doctrine that's even worse than qualified immunity, and it is another um, rule that the Supreme Court invented out of whole cloth, and it is called absolute prosecutorial immunity, and it is exactly what it sounds like. And let me describe really quickly the facts of the last case in which it came up. Here's what it says. Absolute prosecutorial immunity says you can never sue a prosecutor for their misconduct, no matter how bad it was. And here's how bad it can get. There was, um, there was a murder um, in uh, a small town in Iowa just across the river from Omaha, Nebraska. And immediately, uh, the police had a suspect. And they had some pretty strong circumstantial evidence. There was some physical evidence. Um, but their number one suspect was a man who had been seen walking in the air with a shotgun. Uh, he was a white guy. And there was, a, again, a lot of circumstantial evidence. And they were um, building a case. Seemed likely they were going to arrest him, and then suddenly the investigation took a complete left turn, and they went after uh, a group of, of uh, uh, black teenagers who had been joyriding in the area. Um, they'd stolen a car at one point, but they were basically just um, uh, joyriding. And long story short, they manufactured a case against these teenagers. What they did was essentially try to figure out which ones would be willing to uh, testify against another one. And when they figured out kind of who was going to be you know, the victim, they started feeding information to the other teenagers about the crime and the crime scene so that they could appear to have personal knowledge. So they could say, for example, oh, yeah, when we went over that car dealership and that person was shot, we did this and we did that, to the point even where one of them said, um, okay, yeah, that's when we went and, um, you know, so-and-so, the, the, the guy they were setting up, um, shot that guy with a pistol. And the prosecutor who was participating in the investigation went like this. You mean he shot him with a shotgun, not a pistol. Oh, right. That was when he shot him with a shotgun. That's how the investigation went. So they framed these young men. They suborned perjury. And, and believe me, I'm leaving out the details, but it would turn your stomach. I had to read through all these papers one night getting ready for a, a podcast, and I was, I was physically ill by the end of it. So they framed these young men. Oh, by the way, the suspect who almost certainly did it, um, probably the reason why they stopped that investigation, he turned out to be the brother-in-law of a local, uh, local fire chief. 
So they wanted to get themselves some different um, suspects. So these prosecutors framed these young men, suborned perjury uh, deliberately, and obtained an un a conviction that they knew to be unjust, and these guys rotted in jail for over 20 years. And finally, finally, they were exonerated, and they got out, and they sued these prosecutors. And it went all the way to the US Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court um, never got to decide the case uh, because the, um, the county that these prosecutors worked for ultimately uh, decided that they would, they would put up a, a, a lot of money and try to settle the case because they were apparently afraid of the way, which way the Supreme Court would come out. Amazingly, in this case, the issue was not whether to get rid of absolute prosecutorial immunity and, and potentially allow these, these prosecutors to be sued. Everybody agreed that that shouldn't happen. Instead, the only issue is, were they truly acting as prosecutors when they helped manufacture false testimony? Or were they serving more like police investigators and therefore should be stripped of that absolute immunity? Uh, and it was absolutely appalling. Oh, and by the way, guess what happened to those prosecutors? Nothing. Nothing. They continued to serve as prosecutors. They then went off and, and were um, in private practice. They were never disbarred. They were never prosecuted themselves. Nothing ever happened to them. Um, all right, so I'll end on this note. I do think the system is fundamentally broken, but for reasons that a lot of people don't appreciate. I think our criminal justice system is extraordinarily important and one of the most important functions of government. But I think in order to be well-functioning, it has to merit our trust and our support. And I think our criminal justice system merits neither our trust nor support for the reasons that I have described. And I think it is vitally important uh, that we figure out a way to begin to fix it. There are many reasons why that's vitally important, but one of them um, is a number that I'll leave you with, and that is that America, as uh, noted in the flyer for this event, has become the world's leading jailer. We have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. We lock up people at a rate of about 700 per 100,000, and that is about four or five times other democracies. I don't know what the right number of people to have in prison at any given time is, but I am ashamed. I am ashamed that we have that distinction of being the world's number one jailers on the basis of a process that is as problematic as ours is. I don't know what the percentage of innocent people is in American prisons, no one knows. Credible estimates put it at somewhere between five and 10%. That is a figure that should cause all of us to be lying awake at night and to ask ourselves, what can we do to try to fix that system? It doesn't merit our support. It doesn't have integrity. I think it can be fixed. And I can think of few um, problems that face us as a country that are more pressing than to fix our criminal justice system so it's one that we can all respect and trust when it produces those kinds of results. Thank you. <clears throat> And I'd be happy to take questions. I, I see that we have microphones on other, either side of the room, and it looks like Dr. Ortega will so be the microphone. So I'm going to take the microphone around to you. Uh, I was so engrossed, I couldn't get up and stop and do this thing. So let me take it to give it to a student first. Hello there. Uh, my name is Kevin. So you mentioned that um, police officers often use um, handing out tickets and citations as their metric for their performance. Um, and you said people act on their incentives. Do you think there's a better incentive for, for law enforcement officers to use rather than purely citations and drug arrests? I do, uh, much better. I think that, um, that there should be some recognition of the seriousness of the crime and the ultimate results. In other words, you shouldn't just get credit for making an arrest. That credit should be provisional depending on whether there's ultimately a conviction, right? Because that hopefully means you got the right person and that you did so without committing a constitutional violation that would result in the exclusion of the evidence, which happens you know, not as often as I think it probably should, but it does happen. And so I think really it's a question of, of leadership um, that we, we, what, what would be ideal is if the people who um, decided, for example, how much police officers get paid and whether they get promoted would make it very clear that in order to get higher pay, in order to get raises, in order to get promotions, you will be judged not only on the quantity of arrests that you make or citations that you issue, but also on the quality. And essentially kind of maybe take a holistic approach and say, during this shift or this month or this year, whatever the relevant time frame is, did you help to make this community safer and better based on what you did? And the answer is either yes or no. But just how much, you know, how many arrests you make or how many citations you hand out, I think is close to meaningless. Thank you for your question. You're welcome. 
you, you've spoken to the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, um, and maybe in answering this question you need to very briefly tell people how they're perceived. I'm intrigued to know the difference, if there is a difference, in terms of the reaction of the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society to what you've said. <laughs> I appreciate that question, yeah. So the Federalist Society is um, a, a um, it was a group that was started at the University of Chicago by some, um, I think most people will call them conservative. I happen to know them, and I know that they're actually libertarian, or more libertarian than conservative, but let's just say conservative libertarian law students in the 1980s. Uh, and the point of the Federal Society uh, is essentially to, um, to propound and defend ideas of limited government and free markets and um, something I don't agree with. They say uh, one of their, one of their, um, um, one of their bits of their mission statement is judicial restraint, um, which is code for judges n not striking things down, which I think hopefully I made clear which side of that I'm on. Uh, and the American Constitution Society is essentially a progressive or left-leaning um, sort of doppelganger of the Federal Society. They try to be everything that the Federal Society is, uh, but from um, a progressive or, or left-leaning standpoint. I will say that I've never actually um, had an opportunity to talk to the, uh, to, to address an American Constitution Society audience on criminal justice since I've started this work, but I've certainly uh, talked to them on their other issues. And I will say my sense is that criminal justice reform is one of the most bipartisan issues in the whole country. Virtually everybody agrees that there are serious problems in criminal justice that need to be addressed, where there tends to be disagreement is the nature of those problems and what would be the right solutions. And that's perhaps not surprising given that all of us you know, come to these things from different um, um, places. But I think it's immensely, um, it's immensely important and um, reassuring that there is such widespread and bipartisan agreement that there are real problems in criminal justice that need to be addressed. I think that matters a lot. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, of course, awareness is a really important part of change, um, but uh, let's say that there's, uh, there are students here that uh, really were, you know, uh, moved by your uh, presentation and they want to do something and they want to make a difference besides just, you know, maybe telling a few friends about, like, you know, the facts and figures that they remember. What is, uh, what's something that you would recommend uh, that students do if they have, uh, if they have the motivation to help change and help be bigger part of it than just awareness. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. I, I have a bit of an old school response to this question, believe it or not. Um, I actually don't think this is the best time in your life for activism. I think this is the time in your life uh, for education and for honing your skills. I, I, I often give this answer to law students. Uh, what I'll tell law students is, you are learning to be an effective advocate. Don't divert your attention from that process of learning. You know, you could imagine a, you know, uh, I don't know, the Karate Kid or, you know, a martial arts movie, it's, it's you know, the, those, they have like the, you know, the sort of the set plot, right? You know, you meet the master and then you train for a while and then you get to go out and fight the bad guys. And um, I, so my answer really honestly, and I hope I'm not sounding glib, would be um, if you absolutely have to do something, great. You know, you could, uh, you, 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 can, you can research some aspect of this that you find really compelling and you can write blog posts about it um, or, or do whatever it is, you know, whatever social media um, you're into. Um, you, might, um, you might go down to the public defender's office and volunteer and see if they could use an intern uh, and, um, you know, see, see just any setting in which you could just volunteer your time, you know. Um, and I'd be happy to, by the way, talk to you afterwards and we can, I, may, I might have some more concrete ideas. But I, I really think that when you're at this point in your life, the most important thing you can do is to make yourself excellent at whatever it is that you're studying. Uh, and, and then, you know, whatever it is, if you stop here, great. If you go on to something else, um, I think this is the part of your life to, to educate yourself, to give yourself a solid grounding in the way the world works, in the way history, you know, happened, and, and, you know, again, whatever it is that kind of strikes you. I mean, there's too much knowledge to go out and master all of it. But if you really want to change the world, um, make yourself first an effective agent for change. Uh, and I, I would do that. I mean, you, you can practice. I'm not saying never practice. But um, it, it's, it really, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to first really train yourself to be effective. Learn to write really well. Um, you know, when I first started practicing law, um, you could occasionally get into court. I had a couple of jury trials as a young lawyer, which is like a really big deal. Um, but 
what I, you know, the one field that I know a lot about, which is litigating and practicing law, virtually everything important that happens in a, in a court case happens on paper. And, and if you are a, a really good writer, if you're really effective at writing um, persuasive you know, prose, you'll be amazing. And you can really change the world just by being excellent. I feel like it's a totally unsatisfying answer. <laughs> Go out and be excellent. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> I do. Uh, uh, <laughs> I do. Um, step one, play possum. And what that means is don't draw any unnecessary attention to yourself. If you got pulled over and you, know, you don't have any reason to believe that you know, you're in a lot of trouble, just be polite. Comply. You know, give them the driver's license. and just you, Your goal at that point is to get on about your business as soon as possible. If, on the other hand, you have any reason to be concerned, and I probably don't have to enumerate some of the leading reasons that people like you might have, not you, but like in this age group could, could have to be concerned. There are three things. Politely but firmly decline to answer any questions. <clears throat> and I say that because um, many police officers are very effective at drawing you into what appears to be a conversation but is actually an interrogation. Where are you going tonight? You're going over to meet your friends. Oh, you go to school. Where do you live? Oh, I used to live in that dorm, whatever. That may be a conversation, but it probably isn't. It's probably an interrogation. What that police officer is often trying to do is to get you answering questions so that if there comes a point where you no longer wish to answer questions, he kind of knows what the problem is or what you have on your mind that you're worried about. That is incredibly useful information for the police officer to have and very bad information for you to have disclosed and you didn't even mean to do it. Don't go down that road. It's fine, you know, pleasantries are fine, you know, do you have your license, whatever. Oh, by the way, if they ask you, what, do you know why I pulled you over tonight, I hope it, stands, it goes without saying, no, you don't know why they pulled you over. Even if you're going 100 miles an hour, you don't know why that police officer pulled you. The answer, the answer is always no, I don't know. Um, so if there's any doubt, if you have any concerns, politely but firmly decline to answer questions. If the officer uh, asks to search the car, don't agree. Um, and I would say that for a variety of reasons. First of all, there are probably not that many of us who can absolutely, like, for, as a matter of life and death, be certain that no one has had access to your car between you know, the last time you looked in your trunk and the present moment. Um, I hate to say it, but it is also the case that occasionally police officers have been known to plant things in vehicles. There was, uh, unfortunately, uh, a trial in Baltimore involving a corrupt uh, police unit in Baltimore, and there was an abundant amount of testimony about how often they planted uh, drugs and weapons on people. I don't know how, if it, how often it happens, and that's a problem. None of us do. We just know that it does happen. The problem, if you consent to a search, is that any constitutional objections or problems your lawyer down the road could have raised just went out the door. They just went out the door. Uh, and I've talked to probably a dozen criminal defense attorneys and asked them, um, just as a rough estimate, what percentage of clients that you represent would have had a much better outcome if they had refused to answer questions and refused to consent to a search? And the consensus figure is at least 50%. If you just don't answer questions and don't consent to a search. Because even if it makes the police officer angry, even if it says, OK, well, now I'm going to give you special attention or whatever, the important thing is that now, if something bad happens and you get arrested, your lawyer has lots of room to work. But once, the, once you've said something incriminating out of your own mouth or you have consented to a search, you have given your lawyer almost no room to work. And that's problematic. The last thing you should do is once the, you know, once the, the part of the stop that you know, involved like you speeding or getting pulled over, whatever, the, the traffic part of it, once the police officer seems to be done with whatever it is that he pulled you over for. You know, he wrote you the citation or he gave you a warning, whatever. Um, if he tries to continue the conversation or prolong the stop, that you should absolutely ask, am I free to go? Other way to put it is, am I being detained? Because nothing good is going to happen to you for staying around. And there's probably a reason why he wants to keep you there. There may be a drug-sniffing dog on the way. By the way, I don't call them drug-sniffing dogs. I call them PCC dogs, probable cause-creating dogs. 
That dog is brought to the car for one reason and one reason and only, and it's to go like this with his ears. That's an alert, and once that dog does that, they can look in every bit of your car. They can tear it apart. You don't want that dog anywhere near your car, regardless of what's in it, because they always alert. So ask if you're free to go. And if the police officer says no, then respectfully stay where you are. But the beautiful thing is, once he says no, the last remaining shreds of the Fourth Amendment kick into place. And once again, if something bad happens, your lawyer is going to have a lot of room to work. Uh, and so, but if you don't ask that, um, then the police officer never gave you a clear command to stay there. You don't. You, then the Fourth Amendment doesn't come into play as much. So, uh, to review. <laughs> Play possum. Attract as little attention to yourself as possible if you don't have any you know, obvious reason to be worried. But if there's any possibility at all that it's something more than a moving violation or a speeding ticket or something like that, politely but firmly decline to ask questions. Do not consent to a search. And as soon as you know, he gives you that piece of paper or whatever, um, get out of there. And if you're not sure whether you can leave, ask if you can leave. Is that helpful? You bet. Good luck with it. Uh, I want to thank you again. Um, so I have two questions, um, one quick one and one kind of one that you can expand on. Okay. <laughs> the first one would be, does coercive plea bargaining independent of forging testimonies and manufacturing outcomes immediately result in a charge arrest and ultimately a sentence without a trial uh, by jury, uh, or does it go to trial? No, the whole point of a plea bargain is to avoid trial. Um, so essentially what you are offered is, if you will agree to plead guilty to this, that, or the other thing, then we, the prosecution, will do whatever. We'll drop the remaining charges and we'll recommend to the judge that you get a lighter sentence. That is called a plea offer. And if you accept that plea offer, then you have entered into what is called a plea bargain. That will be written up, you will sign it, and that will be the end of your right to a jury trial because you will now have confessed your guilt and agreed to enter a guilty plea and it becomes very difficult to undo that at that point. Um, but the whole point of it is, is precisely so that the prosecution does not have to convict you in open court. That's what they are trying to avoid. Uh, and when we see that the interest of state law enforcement, federal law enforcement, and uh, judicial systems have, in a sense, aligned interest in keeping the net of criminality casted and growing, uh, in your opinion, what's the incentive on the macro scale? Is it high potential for monetary gain, like you mentioned, the 20 million cost in defense, or is it to maintain a sense of departmental importance? Uh, what could it be? Um, it, unfortunately, it's much more mundane than that. Uh, basically, everybody just wants to keep their job. And in order to keep your job, you have to appear to be at least as productive as you were last year. right? And ideally, you're a little bit more productive. And productivity in law enforcement basically means bodies in cuffs for police and bodies in prison for prosecutors. That's basically how we measure productivity. And so, um, in a, in a very real sense, you know, if you've got X number of people employed in law enforcement and you had Y number of arrests and Z number of convictions last year, if those same number of people want to still be employed next year, and they do, then they have to at least equal and perhaps exceed the number they did last year. And it's just that simple. Um, there's a really interesting study by a guy named John Pfaff in a book called Locked In, which is for one of the big books in criminal justice right now, where he documents that um, it was like 20 or 30 years ago, the chances of being prosecuted for any given crime for which you had been arrested were pretty low. Something like, I don't know, one in eight or one in 10. So basically, if you got arrested for something, there was a pretty low chance that you would get prosecuted. Nowadays, the chances of getting prosecuted are very high, are much higher. Uh, and he surmises that what's driving this is that 20, 30, 40 years ago, only the big cities had full-time prosecutors. Only the big cities had a DA's office. Now, virtually every town and city of any size has a full-time prosecutor. That prosecutor has to be productive enough to keep his job or her job. They have to justify their position. How does a prosecutor justify his or her position? By getting convictions. It's as simple as that. And so uh, the rate at which people who have been arrested are then prosecuted has been climbing steadily in his surmise is because we have a much larger number of full-time professional prosecutors and they have got to appear to be productive. And the way you appear to be productive is by getting people convicted. And it's a pretty horrifying but pretty simple calculus. Uh, yes, um, uh, thank you again for coming with this uh, important issue and all the details that you brought to light. Um, I also want to point out the, the gentleman who was asking earlier about what people can do about it. 
there, there are things you can do about it, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that after. Um, my question for you is, um, here in California, there was a ballot measure that passed in 2016 regarding marijuana, and although it's heavily regulated and taxed, um, as long as it's purchased through so-called proper channels, um, it, it's no longer criminal, or it's more or less legal, or, or more legal, a lot more legal than right. it used to be. Right. And some politicians have given some lip service to uh, removing nonviolent convicted felons for crimes involving marijuana. Uh, do you have a, a position, um, or does Cato even have a position on that so that these people who really haven't committed any real crimes uh, can be free of incarceration, free of the tag of felon, which prevents them oftentimes from finding work? Yeah, absolutely, I have a position, thank you. Um, no one who has been convicted of any marijuana-related offense, if that was all they were convicted of, I'm not talking about somebody who shot somebody during a drug, but if all you are in, uh, incarcerated for is a marijuana-related offense, uh, then you should be released and your record should be expunged. And in California, there's a number of cities, um, San Francisco, for example, has, has recently pledged that they will go back and look at uh, all, all the cases of people who have been convicted of marijuana-related crimes, and if that's all you're in for, they will not only release you, they will expunge your record from that, uh, expen expunge that conviction from your record. I think that's exactly the right way to go, because you never really did anything wrong. You violated a law that happened to be on the books at the time that was never, in my judgment, a really legitimate law. I, th I, I frankly would take the position now that Criminalizing simple possession of marijuana, I think, is probably unconstitutional. If it properly read, the Constitution simply does not authorize the government to put people in cages because they happen to prefer um, one harm, relatively harmless, it's not totally harmless, let's put it this way, because they prefer an intoxicant that is a lot safer than alcohol, demonstrably safer than alcohol, uh, I think that's arbitrary, and I think the Constitution does not arbitrarily, or permit the government to arbitrarily put people in cages. And I think we have gotten to the point with marijuana that it is uh, to, to criminalize it and to punish for it is arbitrary. So that, that's my position. Um, but thank you for that question. You gave, gave me a chance to fulminate a bit. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for speaking to us today. Um, going back to the fact that we criminalize way too many behaviors that don't cause harm on other people, right. um, in context of the war on drugs, where is the limit between which, which drugs we can decriminalize and which drugs we should, uh, should remain criminalized? And how do you feel about using paternalism as a justification for limiting or criminalizing drug use that is harmful to oneself but isn't harmful to other people? Well, it's a fantastic question, very well phrased, very articulate. So thank you for, thank you for sending us out on that note. <laughs> So I, I used to take the position that uh, I was only in favor of decriminalizing, you know, sort of the softer drugs like marijuana. I, uh, in the last few years, I have come around to a much uh, different and very strong conviction that we should, we should totally decriminalize. The reason for that is basically twofold. Um, first, there is, uh, this, this issue has been studied and studied and studied, and we've been waging the drug war, depending on how you count, for like 45, 50 years. Um, it, it appears that we have achieved nothing with the drug war. It doesn't appear that we've discouraged much drug use. Uh, it doesn't appear, as we certainly haven't made the, the you know, communities any safer. Um, it's really difficult to identify anything, and I mean anything positive, that has been accomplished by, by enforcing drug prohibition. The other thing that I became increasingly aware of was the absolute pitilessness and violence with which drug prohibition is being enforced in this country. And, and, and you can go on YouTube and see things that would absolutely shock you. Let me leave you with one very vivid example. There was a SWAT raid in Georgia a couple of years ago um, where uh, the, the, they had gotten a tip from a confidential informant that somebody in some house was selling some drugs. I can't remember what it was. Let's say, let's say it was something worse than marijuana. Maybe it was heroin. Who knows? So they decide that they're going to do a drug raid. Um, by the way, that's how drug warrants are, are commonly executed now by, by full-blown SWAT teams. And... Um, when they, they got their briefing, uh, there was no mention of any um, you know, children in the house or anything like that. So the SWAT team gets to the house, and somehow every member of the SWAT team misses the fact that there are now children's toys all over the front yard, and there's a minivan with two children's car seats in the minivan. One of the SWAT officers takes a flashbang grenade, which is an incendiary device that you throw into a room that you want to you know, enter, 
It goes off, it makes a really loud noise and a disorienting flash, and it's essentially so that you can go in there with a tactical advantage. Police officer throws the incendiary grenade in through the living room window and it lands in a crib that is occupied by a three-year-old boy. It goes off and nearly, uh, nearly burns him to death. Um, at which point, uh, the, his mother is not allowed to attend to him. They take him to a hospital. His life is barely saved. He'll be permanently disfigured. That SWAT team completely disclaimed any responsibility. The state of Georgia disclaimed any responsibility. They wouldn't even pay the medical bills as far as they were concerned. That's just, you know, he was just in the wrong place at the wrong, wrong time. I'm not saying that happens all the time. I am saying that happens with more frequency than I can stomach, and I don't want people out in the field claiming to do that on my behalf. You are not doing that on my behalf. So um, those are my two reasons for, uh, not, not because I necessarily think that it would be a good idea for people to be doing drugs. I don't. But I am quite convinced that the drug war has, that there is, we've had plenty of time to document if the drug war was doing anything good, and no one's been able to show that it has. And second, once you realize that the way in which that drug war is being waged, I just want no part of it. And that leads to your last question, which is, do I think that paternalism is a, is a, um, a sufficient or a legitimate basis for criminalizing activity? And the answer is no, I don't. Um, when you propose to put another human being in a cage, you ought to have a really good reason. And the fact that you think they were doing something that was harmful to themselves does not constitute a sufficiently good reason. And by the way, it is going to be very rare that whatever it is that they were trying to do to themselves is worse than what they're going to experience when you put them in a cage. Um, and so as a, both a, a philosophical and a practical matter, I do not support um, um, paternal, paternal, um, even well-meaning paternal uh, instincts and motivations as a basis for enforcing criminal law. And that's a great note to end on. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.